What's up guys? Welcome to the top 50 white sax players from the golden age of jazz. Surprised I could find 50 and the number kept growing as I kept pulling them out, going through my shelves. I'm like, man, another guy, another guy. And like I mentioned in the first episode, a lot of these guys are gonna be fairly obscure to today's collector. But at the time, most of these guys were pretty well-known names from the swing bands with large pedigrees. Uh, when a label was looking for a not risky guy to release, picking a guy from Woody Herman's group or from uh, Stan Kenton's group made sense. Those guys were successful, popular. A lot of their Simon wouldn't be under contract. So you can just bring these guys in and track them and release jazz records that are of great quality for the white consumer to gobble up. And these names were well known. And yet, in today's collector, most of these white guys have fallen into complete obscurity. And most of the guys that were black at the time doing it, you know, in the, in the mid 50s, a lot of those names were really obscure. And I think in our mindset, we're, it's very jaded how we perceive the jazz kingdom from today's eyes. But trust me, the guys who get marketed and publicized and have no notoriety today were very fringe per perimeter guys. Hank Mobley wasn't a known name to the jazz world in 1955. Even in 1960, he was still a very peripheral regional guy appealing to a diehard collector. Most jazz fans, jazz was still kind of a casual listening music for most white America. So you brought home some jazz records and you played them at your party. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of hard cat. Like, we, the way we think of jazz is we're going to listen, so we're going to be sophisticated, and we're going to detail all the goings on. But for the most part, jazz in the 30s, 40s, into the 50s, it was life music. It just, you play, it was the pop music. Songs you knew, standards, good times, fun, didn't require this deep soul searching. And the music that the black artists were making didn't cross over for the most part. And Armstrong, Basie, Ellington, those guys were known in the white world. But most black musicians that we think of today as being jazz, at the time, they, they definitely weren't. They were unknowns. And Blue Note was completely regional and small. Prestige, Argo, these labels were very small, regional things. The LA West Coast labels, Pacific and Contemporary, with their white, great stable of musicians, a lot of them from Kenton and, and Herman's bands, those guys had much more popularity and success and financial gain than the black musicians that we know today. So in some ways, history has corrected that mistake. And we now know the Mobleys and the Donald Birds and the Lee Morgans and a lot of these white guys who were great players but were imitating somebody else's art form on some level. A lot of them just slipped into obscurity. Uh, it's an interesting thing. And it was something that was kind of really driven home putting this together. Uh, number 40 on my list on this countdown was Vito Musso. And Vito Musso born January 16th, 1913. So Vito goes back. Uh, he was born in Sicily. He was a Sicilian. <coughs> there he is. Uh, a little fiery guy, Vito. His, uh, he came across to New York in 1920 <coughs> on an Italian ship called the Patria. He ends up playing with Woody Herman, Tommy Dorsey, Stan Canton, Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, Teddy Wilson, Billy Holiday. It's, again, a pretty universal theme, the pedigree that these guys got. And so when Crown Labels puts this record label, this out of Vito Muzo, there's plenty of white jazz fans who knew who that was gonna be. Uh, it's on the Crown Label, small label out of LA. This has Maynard Ferguson, believe it or not. Chico Alvarez, Milt Bernhardt, Bobby White, and Willard McDaniel. So Maynard's only name I really know well there. It's fun. It's cheeky. It's jungly, you know? And you 
can hear that in Goodman or Ellington's groove. You, you can hear that in Kenton. You know what I mean? It's it's a fun record. It's a fun record. And like I said, it's it's part of that age. That's what was going on. Number 39. A guy that recorded on Capitol and was a part of the West Coast scene for a while was a guy by the name of Boots Mazzuli. Another great Italian name. Boots Mazzuli was also on that fantastic uh, Serge, Chaloff, Serge Chaloff record, which was called um, something Mayburn. Oh, I can't think of the name right now. I'll mention it when I come up to it in a little bit. We'll talk about Serge Chaloff. Uh, he was on that, Boots Mazzuli. Boots Mazzuli's on quite a bit of stuff in this era, part of the West Coast crew. I believe he was also from uh, Massachusetts. Yes, he was. Uh, <clears throat> Boots Mazzuli, he's on that Loaded Savoy record, which is a collection of tracks. So he's recording at Savoy pretty early on. He's born November 8, 1915. Fable of Mabel. That's uh, sort of Chaloff 10 inch on Storyville that he was on. And Storyville was a Boston label. So when Serge made a record, he had his buddy Boots come in. And Boots Mazzulli shows up on quite a bit of stuff on the West Coast. Uh, he ended up teaching music and kind of retired from the scene at some point. It's the only Boots Mazzulli I have aside from the Serge Chaloff. Don't know a ton about him, but the guy could play. It's a fun record and I enjoy it very much. Every time I put it on, I got that in exchange for a double I had of a record with a friend of mine from Seattle. Number 38, a guy by the name of Max Brule. Who was Max Brule, you ask? Max Brule was a Dane. He played the baritone. Wonderful tonality. This is on Emerson, number 36062. So probably about 57, 58. No, probably like 56, 57. That was tracked. Uh, Max Brule, uh, born July 14, 1927. He was, believe it or not, also a Danish architect. And the tallest building in Denmark, a hospital in Copenhagen, he designed it. So. He might have had a little something to fall back on. But that being said, Max is a great player. And he uh, also was a great pianist. And he's like I said, he plays the baritone sax. Uh, I believe he retired to doing more the business side of life, but I think he did play music for a long time in Europe. And I've always really enjoyed this record. It's a tough session to come by. But these old Emerson's never go for too much. Jorgen Rieg is on this, Eric Mos Moselholm, Leif Soyberg, William Schof, Bent Oxen. So it looks like it's pretty much a Danish, maybe some Swedish go Patriots on the whole session. Whether it was recorded in America, that I don't know. But it's a great, great record. And he has a wonderful tone. But the baritone kind of lends itself to that. Number 37. Another giant of this music that doesn't get a lot of credit nowadays is Bud Freeman. Bud Freeman is one of the most swinging cats the music's ever seen. He uh, was in the swing scene to a large degree, born April 13th, 1906. He was a band leader, he was a composer, uh, he, big part of the Chicago sound and the scene, uh, swing era giant. He uh, was a member of the Austin High Gang, uh, along with Jimmy McPartland and Frank Tashmacher. And these guys would go to Chicago and hear the black, black guys play, and they wanted to swing, and they really did learn how to swing with the best of them. And Bud Freeman led groups into the 50s. <clears throat> and Bethlehem gives him this shot to record here. And he's a very gutsy, ballsy player. Great arranger. Comes up with great pieces for his band to play. You know? And this is a fairly 
inexpensive Bethlehem BCP record. You can find that for 10, 15 bucks generally. And like I said, it's great. Ruby Braff is on the trumpet. George Wetling on the drums. Al Hall on the bass. Got a couple different piano players on it. Definitely a record. Bud Freeman and Cy, uh, Ruby Braff alone are worth the price of admission. Now, number 36, we have another Dane, if my memory serves. Belgian, sorry. Bobby Jasper. And Bobby's going to be known to some of you guys nowadays because he shows up on a couple of prestige records with Herbie Mann, and I think he's with Idris Salaman on one of them. Uh, those Herbie Mann 7100 series prestige records are fairly popper, popular. Fruits, flute, souffle, and I can't remember what the other one's called right now. I actually meant to pull him and I forgot. But uh, <clears throat> he's a Belgian, a proponent of the cool sound. Uh, he ended up getting more in a hard bop when he heard Parker, which is pretty common thread for most of these guys. He uh, plays in some great groups. He gets two records as a leader here. This is one with George Vaughn and Nigel Suleiman at Riverside, number 240, which puts it about 1957. And then this one's on Emerson 36105, which probably puts us about 1959. And like I said, those two uh, Herbie Mann records are probably in that same era, 58, 59. He's a great player. He plays a number of different instruments, including uh, the flute, sax, and being a composer. Uh, he, he plays with J.J. Johnson. He plays with Kenny Burrell, plays with Miles Davis, Coltrane, Donald Byrd, and of course Herbie Mann. So he plays with a lot of fairly prominent names. And I think he's one of the names on this list so far that more people will have heard of than like the guy I'm going to show you next, Georgie Old. And from my understanding, old is a German word for old. But he's actually a fiery player, Georgie Old. Just a real ball of fire. Uh, Georgie Old, born May 19th of 1919. Born once again in Toronto, Canada. It's interesting how many of these guys are of international repute coming from Canada, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden. The uh, Georgie, his parents bought him a saxophone before they moved to the U.S. And in 1929, I guess, they moved to Brooklyn, New York at the age of 10 years old. And he starts hearing the swing movement and he starts, before you know it, playing Again, a long list of the greats. Bunny Berrigan, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, Errol Garner, Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Frank Rosalino, uh, Georgie All through and through is a big band guy. And he gets another record here, I believe. Yep, Georgie Ald and his orchestra. This is 36090, 36060. So probably 58 probably 16 on that one. They're both this. Big, swinging, bright affairs. <clears throat> and even myself two years ago, I would say to myself, why is Emerson putting out records by a guy by the name of Georgie Ald? I didn't understand it. But when I dug deeper and deeper, got to know the labels better and better, this was not a risky choice. This was a fairly safe choice. The guy played with all the great swing groups. He's gonna be known to a lot of the jazz consumers. And they're gonna know this guy better than Clifford Brown. They're gonna know this guy better than Charlie Parker. These names were synonymous with their record collections and looking on the back of their 78s. Oh, who's on this session with Benny Goodman? Who's playing with Artie Shaw on this one? These names were known. And jazz, again, was more of a hanging out conversation, background pop music, 
for the first years of its life, first decades of its life, 20s, 30s, 40s, into the 50s. The jazz that we think of today as this intense kind of expression of the soul and emoting, it was a much funner, looser, more celebratory music in its swing era. And the black guys were celebrating to overcome their sorrow, and the white guys were celebrating because they didn't have no sorrow, uh, comparatively. And the other interesting thing about this dynamic with these white groups is because segregation was still very uncommon in, in the bands, they would play together after hours, integrated, but for the most part, because the lineups didn't record integrated very much, the Benny Goodman, Teddy Wilson, Lionel Hampton thing was the exception. So for the most part, White Cats still recorded with White Cats. And so what we actually have there is the lack of exposure that most of these white artists have because they're all playing with each other and not with the black names we know. We don't really spider web into these circles the same way. See what I'm saying? And the black musicians, the Miles Coltrane universe sends us into all these other musicians, but they're mostly going to be black. <clears throat> and the white universe exists kind of in a very separate plane. And it swings just as hard, was more popular, and sold more records, and guys could play with equal ferocity and intensity. They're expressing different narratives. That's the difference. And the, that, that's what the integrity of the black music is. But these white cats weren't unknown. They were solid entities. And because they were so interwoven with each other, it ends up that the whole community kind of becomes forgotten. And the guys who cross the color lines, like Bill Evans and Jerry Mulligan, and some of those guys are, are, are more the exception. You know, uh, it's there's not a lot of Pepper Adams in this world. You know, white cats that mostly play with brothers. Pepper Adams was that cat. We'll get to Pepper Adams eventually in this series. Uh, number 34, Aubrey Moore, also known as Brew Moore. Uh, another fiery player. This Brew Moore plays a lot of swing, a lot of blues, a lot of bluster. <clears throat> this is a record on Fantasy, number 222. So 22 releases in. Kind of a cool cover. He's playing some kind of strange horn there, isn't he? <clears throat> it's a, a great little fantasy recording. Brew, born March 26th of 24. Uh, he swings hard with soul. Played with Stan Getz, Zoot Sims. Uh, he plays with Cal Jader and Fantasy. Uh, the, the Getz and Zoot Sims records is that brother's record early on in Prestige. 7,004, 7,006 in there somewhere. Early Prestige, there's a brother, record called The Brothers with Stan Getz and Zoot Sims. And Brew Moore is on that. And it was recorded like in 51 or 52. But he's definitely a fiery, fiery player. Uh, he's on that Chuck Wayne guitar record on Savoy, number 12,073 or something like that. That's a great record. Brewmore's on that. Uh, he's one of the hardest swinging white guys out there. You know, and if you find a session that's got Brewmore on it, by all means, you should grab it. Because the guy's going to throw down. He's just one of those cats with an intensity about him. Uh, even that kind of tells you something about him. Got a bit of clowning to him. And he takes his swinging really seriously. Number 33. On my countdown to the top 50 sax players of White Kingdoms. Guy by the name of Jack Bontrose. And not related at all to J.R. Bontrose. Different guy. Jack Bontrose is a bit of a tragic figure, born on December 30, 1928. He's a tenor player, a great young player. Uh, he arranged for Clifford Brown early on out west. He uh, was a cool jazz cat, west coast cat, pretty much through and through. He uh, has a couple of records here at uh, Pacific. This is some of the stuff he arranges for Clifford Brown here. Russ Freeman, Zoot Sims, Shelly Mann. Uh, two different sessions on this that come from the Tendon Chair. Uh, he was a great player. He uh, 
Grand Arranger as well. Also was from Detroit originally before he went out west. Plays with Chet Baker a long time on some of Chet Baker's classic stuff. But like Chet Baker had a bad heroin problem. A bad heroin problem. And uh, it's heroin doesn't see black or white. You know, it takes equal <clears throat> from both. Uh, he ends up in strip joints playing in kind of bars and then he ends up in Vegas playing in the casinos for a while but uh, his heroin really stripped his career away from him and if I even think I think he even overdosed eventually if I remember right but it's kind of a sad story along with Russ towards like another guy that kind of dies young from the West Coast scene uh, <clears throat> but he was a great arranger really came up with some fascinating counterpoints and uh, <clears throat> some melancholy in his in his in his sounds and he swings. It's a guy you should look for is Jack Montrose. And Jack Montrose records don't go for big money. You know? Pacific records really never do. <clears throat> uh, again, well that's partly a function that sold pretty well. That's the big X factor always is sometimes the, the rarity of something, how well it's sold, will determine its price as much as how good it is. Of course, it can be rare as fuck and nobody wants it. I think it's worth shit. Another West Coast guy. This is on the Stan Kenton Presents series on Capitol. A guy by the name of Bob Cooper. And Cooper is a fun player, born December 6, 1925. Uh, West Coast tenor, and he played the oboe well, as well with Bud Shank. On some pretty memorable sessions. Big fan of Bob Cooper. He plays a lot with the Shelly Mann groups. Uh, I think he's in the Howard Rumsey Lighthouse All-Star group for a while. Uh, he married June Christie. He's playing with Stan Kenton's band. And June Christie sang for Stan Ken Kenton's band. And... He ends up marrying June Kersey, and uh, they stayed together for quite a long time, if I recall, all the way up to her passing, if memory serves me right. I looked it up last night, uh, but I looked up a lot of things last night, yesterday and today. Uh, music of Bob Cooper, this is on the contemporary label, 3544, and like I said, he's surrounded by a lot of those guys on contemporary, on the Pacific label, the guys who played at Capitol that were kind of crossovers. Frank Rosalino, Victor Feldman, Lou Levy, Max Bennett, Mel Lewis, Conti Condoli, Pete Condoli, Don Fadraquist. So he's playing part of that whole scene. And he shows up on a lot of records at that time frame. A guy who doesn't get a lot of records as a leader, but is worth, worthy of number, spot number 31 on my list here, is a guy by the name of Richie Kamuka. And Richie Kumuka was from Philadelphia, if memory serves. Born July 23, 1930 from Philly. And uh, he's a fantastic, cool player. Very influenced by Lester Young. <clears throat> and honestly, if you really think about it, Lester Young is kind of cool. A lot of the things that we think of and define as the sound of the cool Lester Young embodies that in a lot of sensibilities. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of records as a leader. This is a record that's kind of a collection on the Hi-Fi record label, a West Coast label. He gets first billing on this, along with Conti Condoli, Frank Rosalino, Bill Holman, Vince Guaraldi, Monty Budwig, and Stan Levy. It's a great record. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, Bill Holman is another white sax player that I don't even have a record by. I've almost bought his Stan Kent Presents Jazz record a few times, but it all got removed from my car at the last minute. But Holden's a great player as well. But Kamuka plays a lot with Al Cohn, Zut Sims, but that kind of conglomerate. He was part of that great uh, Stan Kenton, where did my page go? Uh, part of that great Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, uh, sorry, the Four Brothers Sax section. And the Woody Herman's heard. A lot of it was Alcone, 
and guys like Bill Perkins and Richie Kamuka, and they play on a lot of each other's records. There's a couple of Alcone records where Kamuka is kind of equally billed. But the place where most folks are gonna know Richie Kamuka from is the fantastic Shelly Mann group, this Night at the Blackhawk series. Uh, the versions of these songs I hear Summertime and Our Delight, just the whole series is just wonderful. And <clears throat> Joe Gordon on the trumpet is fantastic. And the soft, breezy tones of Kamuka with Joe Gordon is a lot of the magic of these records. And so a lot of people are going to know Kamuka <clears throat> more by his music than by his name. But uh, Kamuka's a great player and certainly deserves all the credit in the world. He also plays with Art Pepper. <laughs> He's also a Lighthouse All-Star. He played with Stan Kenton and Woody Herman, once again. Uh, Chet Baker, Shorty Rogers. So again, you're seeing a guy like this, all the talent in the world, Kenton Herman, white groups, Chet Baker, white, Shorty Rogers, white, Lighthouse All-Stars. Actually, the bass player um, was a brother, but the most, of the, most of the group is white. Um, Howard Rumsey was a brother. Art Pepper, Shelly Mann, Al Cohn, Bill Perkins. So his whole universe, he's playing with white guys. And that's partly why so many of these guys end up being so obscure. So that wraps up number 40 through 31. I hope you're enjoying this so far. I know I enjoy putting it together. And believe me, it took me most of yesterday to assemble this stuff. So I hope people watch this. You know, I hope people dig this because it was fun and it's interesting. And then we'll look at the black guys after this. And there's a lot of those guys. So, I uh, appreciate that. Stay tuned. We're going to do episode three coming up real quick. Peace.